how do we nurture those customers and engage with them more? As an entrepreneur, you're a risk taker and you're quite optimistic, even though if people say it's impossible, that's crazy. Rolo Millership, a visionary entrepreneur, champion for local food producers and founder of Nourish Communities. Learn how Rolo is transforming ordinary local shopping into extraordinary consumer-led experiences. I'm prepared to do everything within the business. I started working on farmers markets around London when I was 14 years old. Now we represent around 200 different independent producers and growers. Oh my God, are we gonna succeed? Will this work? Initially, maybe I'd hold back and not say something. But then at the end of the day, we haven't sold it. If I don't tell you to display something in a certain way, we'll lose 200 pounds. What's the biggest business lesson you've learned oh. building nourished communities? Mm. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Borostovsky. Can I ask you a favor? Help me reach 1,000 subscribers and leaving a comment in the comments below that you have subscribed. Your support means that I can bring more inspiring change makers to show you how to transform your career and become a better leader yourself. Thank you so much. Why a business that focuses on local producers? Why is that important for you? Oh, good question. I think Growing up working on farmers markets, you build communities around them. And even though you might only have an interaction with someone for like 10 seconds, because often they're huge queues and you're mm. just selling stuff, you really build up a bond with that person. I find it amazing that community you build of people you know, who want to help you or want to tell you things like really intimate things. And you build that relationship over years and years. And I think... Um, you know, to be able to build a business that caters to community um, and not just growth and like unrealistic expectations of growth, I think mm. it, for me is really important. Um, I also think that, you know, for there's there are different levels of community in terms of you know, we've got community within our business. Uh, we've got community of customers around us. We've got the community of food entrepreneurs. And I think that's an area that really resonates with me is that people don't often look at food entrepreneurs as being like as sexy or glamorous as tech entrepreneurs, but mm. they're doing exactly the same thing. They're taking the same risks. Um, they have the same skills, you know, uh, similar skill sets. And um, I think, you know, we work with lots of our producers in the capacity of advising them on marketing, on routes to markets, on manufacturing, on investment, on, you know, a huge tons of things, um, things that people might often pay a consultant to do, but we're, you know, they're part of our community and we want to, we want to support them. And I think that's, what's really exciting is we, you know, we'll connect producers who want to share kitchens or we'll connect people going through the same problems or issues or who are, struggling to get listed in supermarkets or, you know, uh, so I, 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 we find, you know, through giving back into our community of producers and through supporting them that they support us. And yeah, it's, it's enriching. It's fun. Um, mm. Everyone is within the business is really excited about what we're building. Um, and I think you'll, there aren't that many businesses that I can think of in the UK that are able to retain like, I don't know, there's a real a tangible feeling of excitement um, amongst the, uh, us because we feel like we're, we are supporting people. Uh, you get exciting. to know so many people, so many yeah. different, you know, <laughs> yeah. the suppliers, the customers, yeah. like you're really yeah. like in the in the thick of it. It's really exciting for me was we held this festival in Walthamstow uh, in Big Penny Social where we had effectively like bringing together and this, I think, is you know, for us is really exciting and empowering. Is bringing together, you know, we brought together a hundred of our top producers from across the UK. We had eight people speaking around different topics around regenerative agriculture, agriculture and farming, and then we also had sort of ten or twelve workshops around everything from like knife making to kimchi making, and and we had over two thousand people, uh, you know, from our community coming, and that was a really exciting thing for us because it allowed us to introduce customers to the producers who might have been buying someone's chocolate for the last three years um and it's really rewarding for the producer to have a customer who's you know really excited about their product mm. but they've never even met before um and equally a lot of the producers are so busy 
you know, it's a really, it's, it's a graft um, producing food um, and uh, that they don't get to meet other people mm. uh, do, do, facing the same challenges as often. So for them to be together, you know, there are tons of connections mm. made there. So that was a really amazing kind of physical manifestation of all of the different connections mm. we've built over the last, well, my, over my lifetime. Maybe, I guess. It's so interesting because with industrialization of food, mm. we have become so separate from the food that we eat that we have yeah. no connection to it whatsoever. So you go yeah. to a supermarket or more often than not, especially in London, yeah. you don't even go anywhere. You just have everything Multi. delivered to yeah. you. Yeah. And what you and your team have been doing, and I don't know why I didn't think of that before, mm. but when you go in, yeah. you know, you or someone else, oh, hey, this chocolate has come in. Yeah. Do you want to try That's and right. yeah. tell the story of where it comes from? And all of a sudden, it has more meaning. It yeah. has more of a story. You know where it yeah. comes from. It's not just a piece of chocolate in a wrapping from somewhere mm. that you don't know that you just consume. There is a person a farm, a manufacturer that yeah. is a real human being somewhere Definitely. out there. Yeah. And then what you're talking about, bringing people as at a, at a festival, then mm. it's going even one step further and teaching people, yeah. hey, you know, your food, you can be more loyal and more passionate about a product mm. because you know the individuals behind it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think that idea of connection as well, you know, allowing people to really connect with food i think with people have become really desensitized to food you know people go to the i don't know supermarket and they buy chicken breast but they their stories people not knowing what a chicken is you know or yeah. and things like that or people never having seen a cow and i think it's kind of trying to make food more tangible and uh and promote more of like a slow food movement and i think the the thing that people always say is yeah you'll you know, it, the question that always comes up is around accessibility, you know, in terms of price, particularly as we're going into cost of living crisis. And I think that's one of our core things that we're really focused on. We, we about a few years ago, we did start something called the Curry Club, in, in which was feeding, I think it was 200 families around Islington um, uh, each month, uh, which is partnering with different chefs to, um, and we provided all of the food for free for meals to be cooked. And that's something we're really hyper aware of. And we're about to, we do veg boxes, um, uh, which are subscription based, um, grown all regeneratively grown in Cambridge. And, and you know, the, the range is sort of from 11 pounds to 21 pounds. But we're, we're hyper aware of the fact that we also want to, we're looking to create pay it forward boxes to try and make food more accessible to people. And I think what we try and do is have a range, you know, if you want to buy sashimi grade salmon for us you can but also if you want to buy you know a, a cheaper uh, salmon we also have that option so it's challenging to do but that's kind of what we try and do to you know navigate that path mm. to make sure it's not all you know inaccessible to mm -hmm. people no that's so important take me back you mm. were talking about you know your dad saying oh you need to go on the age of 14 yeah tell me about that moment in your life uh i think it I do, yeah, I, it, it was interesting then because actually, you know, having a job and earning money, you would have more money than your friends at that age. And it, it was quite empowering to be able to do that. And, and you were put into, you know, quite interesting situation because, you you know, you, you, have, you can't control who your customer is and you're chucked in. You just have to deal and get things done. And, you know, often, also often, you know, at 15, 16, I was managing people who were like 30, um, which was often quite interesting because obviously someone who's a bit older maybe doesn't want to be managed by this 15, 16 year old, you know, mm. um, but who's, who's done the farmer's markets for longer than them. So, so it was, um, it was quite empowering. It was definitely challenging, yeah, you know, physically, but also in terms of managing people and understanding, listening to people and understanding, you know, there you, you, I was having to manage people, but often without uh, trying to make them feel like they're being managed so that mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't, there wouldn't be, uh, you know, a uh, tricky situation. So you, you had to be a bit more creative in the way that you got people to work and the way you would work mm -hmm. together on the market. So you had to exercise your leadership skills very early on. Yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah, so, yeah, 
Yeah, it is interesting, particularly with, uh, you know, often people who are not super excited by the product. So I guess my, I was more like the, my job was to create an excitement around the products to help to sell them um, and then to learn how, uh, and I think the markets are interesting in terms of from like a leadership perspective, because it's very tangible. It's like, if, if I don't tell you to display something in a certain way, we'll lose 200 pounds, you know? So I think that's, what's quite interesting is that, you know, there's no beating around the bush. Like, it's like you, you if I, if I initially, maybe I'd hold back and not say something, but then at the end of the day, we haven't sold everything. So then, you know, it's like, as you do it more and more, you're, you're much more, your ability to just point stuff out or suggest mm -hmm. like, have you ever thought of doing it this way or this way is actually better. So is it something that you have figured out yourself or you were seeing what other people were doing? Like, how do you no, know if yeah. you don't arrange the product in such a way that yeah. you're going to lose 200 pounds? Um, I think you would just learn through experiencing it, I guess. So mm -hmm. actually a lot of the people that, I was managed by, excuse me, were not very um, uh, good at management and would often people would like leave, you know, upset or so my, I said, effectively my role was kind of to mitigate and to kind of, um, you know, to assist uh, in softer management in a way. And that was what I was good at was sort of understanding what were the requirements and then conveying that in a way that was, you know, uh, accessible for people but also in a manner which doesn't make them feel stressed and upset and worked up because um because it is fast-paced you know mm. it's a bit like it's 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 hospitality work effectively you know it's like working in a restaurant or and you're under lots of pressure you've got lots of things running through your mind you know and you have to deliver things in a calm way to your team to make sure that they don't feel like oh my god mm. what's going on and i think those are skills that are you know really useful um and and being able to communicate under pressure while someone is, you know, uh, deliberating over whether they want. Mm. Well, how do you yeah. keep cool under pressure? So, you know, mm. things are not working out, you know, emotions running high. Yeah. You have to deliver a message to, you know, somebody mm. who's older than you, yeah. who perhaps is, you know, maybe sensitive. Yeah. Like, what do you say? Oh, uh, how do you do it? What's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't, I think, um, I think it, de it really depends on the person, but you know, how you frame it, you know, it might be like, have you ever considered trying this or, you know, I find that it's great to experiment or, or, you know, if, they, if they are being very kind of obtuse and saying, no, we're doing like this, or I don't care. You, you, you can be like, okay, well, let's just experiment with this for today and see how it goes, you know, or, so it's kind of like, it's finding a way of, even if someone says no, it's like um, saying like, yes, and let's give this a go today, you know? Um, and so, I mean, more recently, you know, we've, I've gone on, um, I did an improv uh, uh, course recently and it's quite interesting because a lot of the techniques- Improv as in acting? Improv uh, comedy, yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay. uh, and it looks at, and because a lot of improv groups uh, now started around how do you take elements of comedy and apply them in a, a business environment? So. You know, um, and and they're really they're fun. I did one when I was working. At so this was pro is this for the purpose of applying this to business, or is this for fun? This I did it for fun. Okay. But a lot of them now, a lot of these improv classes now look at, and it would be interesting for you to look at. Mm -hmm. um, they look at taking how do we take elements of improv and how do we apply them in a business environment? And there are different things like the yes and technique. Mm -hmm. So you know, someone says something and you and you disagree, and instead of me saying like no saying yes and that's interesting let's try this or you know so there's a positive affirmation so you feel like he's agreeing with me or she's agreeing with me but then you can uh, disagree entirely or you know you're proposing something different and I think naturally you kind of find yourself doing these sort of techniques from a younger age um, but it's very it was very interesting to kind of then go on this course and see you know uh, see uh, I don't know uh, um, a theory apply, you know, a, a, a label to it. Um, yeah, like but, it's a technique, it's a tool yeah, to be able tool. to use that's yeah. used for, used in one context, but can be easily applied in another. When we started, we definitely had the issue of like trying to do too many things. Uh, you know, we were trying to do everything. 
um, and not being realistic. And I think also there's an element of, you know, if you're asking 18 different people, what should we do? You know, it's going to become extremely challenging. And you're like, yes, we'll do them all. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, at one point uh, in the business, you know, the idea was everyone had their own side project. So, you know, one of the um, people who helped set up King's Cross also started a yoga studio there. You know, um, someone started the uh, the mushroom workshops. You also had, uh, uh, there's a guy on the, is Highbury who makes knives, you know, handmade knives and stuff. And, you know, we just had so many different things going on. Mm-hmm. And now we've kind of stripped it back. And I think there's a, it's interesting. You want to include everyone, but you also need to also make, decisions to make sure things get done and um there's that element of also just deciding on a path and taking that path instead of you know deliberating because mm-hmm. if all your resources focus on doing that one thing instead of four things it's going to be well, that's thing. two different ways of yeah. thinking isn't it there's the one where well yeah. let's experiment let's see what works mm-hmm. what doesn't and then the yeah. other is like well we're just going to be super focused very niche and just go for one thing yeah from my experience the same thing applies to sports people picking mm. a sport they usually yeah. try out lots and lots of different things yeah, before the thing. they figure out what they like and what they're good at yeah. and the same thing for careers i think it's important yeah. to try a few things mm. first to see how you fit in within that yeah. and then concentrate on one specific thing Definitely. and i think yeah. within businesses you don't always know what's going to work no. so it's yeah. the idea of experimentation and you sort Definitely. of see what the right thing is yeah. and kind of and then what zero works. in on that yeah exactly we've tried kind of supper clubs we've tried uh wine tastings we've tried um uh, uh a conference sort of style events we've done festivals we've done yoga studio uh you know we've done so many things and 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 it's been great but you know when we tried a cafe uh and then now we've kind of cutting back cutting back cutting back and now we're becoming focused and doing what we do really well and so um but and how did you so for decision making mm. how do you decide what not to do and what to focus on um it will usually be It'll be a combination. We do like strategy meetings with like four or five of the core team to come up with, okay, is this working? Is that not? Um, we're constantly evaluating projects. So, excuse me, um, quite quickly, you know, King's Cross is very apparent. We're burning through money there. And we were like, you know, we're, we're very quick to make uh, financial decisions, sometimes too quick, <laughs> you know, um, but we'll respond very quickly and we'll also set things up very quickly um, and test them and see if they work. And if they don't, then cut them off so do you have a process for that i we we don't actually i mean we i think we we meet you know we, now we meet monthly as a team and we evaluate every different areas of the business what's working onboarding processes I, the last three months i think well, our business is the reason um what we've been doing is particularly challenging is that we have built all of physically built all of the stores ourselves so we built Finji Park, then we built Walthamstow, and then here we did plan on having builders build it, <laughs> but um, the builder who was booked in um, had some issues with drinks and drugs and didn't show up. Wow. So then suddenly, you know, we'd taken the lease and then we needed to build the shop. And so we built it in two weeks, which was doing like 17, 18 hours a day mm-hmm. of building it. And, and the last like eight months, really, has been me like coordinating, you know, the build the building work, which is great because we've saved, you know, more than a hundred thousand pounds building it ourselves. Um, uh, but at the same time, what the business so about a month, two months ago, we sat down as a team, actually with my girlfriend, and um, did like a strategy session with her, um, which we've never really done like properly. And and what became very apparent was that you know, we had thought we were going to say, what's our vision? What are all the cool things we're going to do? Um, But what became really apparent was that everything internally needed to work better (laughs) before we could do that. So in the time that I had been building and I had not been able to focus on the business, you know, um, making sure suppliers are paid on time, like, you know, these kind of things. So now what we've done (laughs) is we have basically... um, 
looked at every process in the business. So the last month, the five like core team have basically been writing out processes for every process in the business. And so Thursday, we have our strategy session where we basically, we're creating almost like a Bible for employees. And and, and it's really interesting because it's kind of like, what are the different stages of growth? Because when there are four or five of you, I can just say, hey, this is what we're going to do. But when there are 18 of you, it's much more complicated. And also what you might take for granted, you know, uh, as is, you know, say hi to a customer or, you know, this is how you refund a product or, you know, uh, what you might take for granted isn't taken for granted. And it, it's interesting because I, I studied anthropology and I've always really fascinated by, you know, communities. And I think it's at Dunbar theory where, you know, once uh, people can only maintain it's like a hundred healthy relationships or something like that. Um, uh, but then with a company that accelerates, so it's like maybe 40 or I can't remember, but you know, it, 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 when you need to look at like silos of information and the reason that we have a particularly unique and challenging circumstance is that typically in a, like a startup um, or a small business, you have all everyone working together. However, we're working across three different sites. So everyone is separated. Um, So you've not only got, uh, you've got a very fragmented team that you need to train and educate and inspire and teach, you know, and and that's been the real challenge. And we are, you know, we've managed to do it. But at the same time, it's quite a unique challenge because typically Mm. a small business, you have everyone together and everyone is just, you know, information is bouncing around all the time. You would be Mm. surprised how often you make that expectation that if they're together, that still doesn't necessarily work. Yeah, true. So I feel like, Mm. As a result of not being together, you are not relying on that. Have yeah. you seen the film? And I don't know, maybe Philippa will remind me what yeah. the name of it is. The founder? McDonald's? The founder. Uh, I, re- I seen really it? want to see it. I started yeah. reading his book. So it's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's the story of McDonald's. Mm. And there is this moment very early in the film where the original founders of McDonald's, the McDonald's store, they go through all of the steps to create this format, like every yeah. single thing. And they, it's like a dance. It's like this yeah, choreographed dance that is just brilliant of how they've managed to yeah. explain to you what it takes to create this, you know, every sing- every single single step like yeah. literal step within the kitchen like yeah. where you wash your hands to where you do the burgers to you know how people move around like everything mm. is documented and perfected yeah. to like you know within an inch of its life yeah and so that is necessity for when you have several locations yeah, yeah. so that you do everything exactly the same 100 percent, and particularly within you know franchise models it's sort of like cookie cutter almost done done and i think you know we one of the things we want to look at is how do we begin to open more stores now that we're you know starting to become profitable is um, uh, open new stores but how do you also create a unique feel to that store um so the idea is for each place to have a unique thing to it or feel um so all them so well uh finchie park has like mushrooms and bees uh upper street hopefully will have like little garden um, Waltham so is we're doing lots of tasting sessions and workshops and things so uh, but yeah it's interesting to think about how do you you know create a model that can and also by the nature of what we do is you know we work with local supply chains so for like a I don't know like an investor or a VC or someone like it's counterintuitive because it's not infinitely scalable you know like I think if you build and you, if you build real local supply chains, it might take longer. But once you build it, it's much more sustainable and it's much more powerful. There's, you know, uh, it, and it's much more responsive and you're not reliant on elast- like the elasticity of global supply chains. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to sort of see what our, where our journey takes us in the, mm. over the next Years, no, I'm very so. excited. <laughs> yeah. What's the biggest business lesson mm. you've learned oh. building nourished communities? Mm. Um, good question. I think being very realistic with numbers. I think it, as an entrepreneur, you're very, you, by nature, you have to be, you know, you're a risk taker and you're quite optimistic, even though if people say it's impossible, that's crazy. Um, but I think being very realistic with numbers is so important because ultimately if you run out of money, you're screwed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if there's no more money, then what do you do? Um, so that's a, a big one, I'd say. 
Um, and I think also a really important one is understanding that not everyone, uh, and I think I've never had, never not known this, but I've seen it happen in other businesses is understanding that not expecting other people to care as much about your business as you do. And also not expecting people to do things quite to the standard that you might. And I think that's a big challenge I find with um, some managers could be, or, you know, is to, you know, someone might do a job at 70% of what you might do it at, but having, you know, three people doing 70% is still better than you trying to micromanage someone and make sure it's done to a hundred percent. And, you know, so I think, the, it's so important to make people feel empowered within their roles to get the best from them. Um, so, but yeah, I'd say being really realistic around numbers and also ensuring people feel like they have the autonomy to, I guess, activate their passion for a role. Um, Cause then they begin to think about marketing. They begin to think holistically about the business, you know, like, uh, the people who are working with us feel they don't feel like they're working in just a shop. They they buy into this vision that we're creating a better world and better ecosystem for communities around us. So, and I think that comes from the fact that you know they have the autonomy to decide to give someone a discount or give someone a free apple or you know to make a mistake. Like mm. you know, we deal with so many thousands of items, mistakes are always going to happen. You know, we deal in logistics of fresh, frozen, and dried ingredients so that even supermarkets with, you know, billions in revenue struggle with, let alone, you know, a much smaller business. So um, I think it's letting people make mistakes as well. Mm. No, for sure. Allow some Definitely. element of risk taking and yeah. being able to fail because otherwise you just don't learn anything. Definitely. And, and I think also blame, you know, like there, there are lots of big mistakes that will always happen. And it's not saying like who's responsible for this. It's understanding, you know, what led to that, you know, the, the freezer gets left open and everything melts and you lose <laughs> thousands of pounds of stuff, you know, like it does happen mm -hmm. or I don't know, the windows get smashed or, you know what I mean? Like there's no, benefit to anyone by getting angry and frustrated by it so it's trying to find a solution to it so that and then mm -hmm. trying to understand what caused it in the first place um and, and i think that's the, the also, uh, i think a really valuable thing as well is perspective you know like if someone has done something that seems a bit off or weird it is trying to understand why uh, the why behind it and why they've acted in that way rather than you know, getting angry about it or frustrated is mm. sort of because actually there there might be a lot many other things that you don't know about that have occurred that have led to this. Mm. You know, so just having that empathy and seeing it from mm. a different perspective. Yeah, exactly, mm. exactly. Talking about making mistakes, what's been the biggest mistake failure <laughs> that you've made in your business? Oh, mm. interesting. Um, what's been the biggest mistake we've made in our business? It's very challenging because so many mistakes happen like every, all the time, you know, uh, in the nature of what we do. Um, I think, um, maybe a yeah. mistake that yeah. should have derailed you, but yeah. didn't. Oh yeah. Uh, I think to be honest, uh, initially our accountants, <laughs> um, uh, the first, I didn't completely understand um, uh, around tax, uh, and I, I, our accountants assumed I, I did, and uh, that we got sent a bill for like I don't know, it was a lot, it was like fourteen thousand pounds or sixteen thousand pounds that we had to pay in one or two days, and that almost derailed us completely, and we, we I managed to just pay it, and and that was a big learning, you know, for from me but also but that that was more a, a bit of a lack of communication between one person thinking i'd done this before and me maybe not making it clear enough um so that was pretty challenging um what else um and then other ones have been to be honest at, at one point with the business i actually left the business to launch uh, another business uh, for someone and that didn't go quite as planned and when I then came 
back to the business. Um, the business then had to sustain two more salaries that I had left the business. Um, and then two of us came back and, and that was very challenging. Um, and then fortunately we managed to raise a bit of investment around that time, um, which is what managed to support us opening <clears throat> um, the new sites. Um, I think we've been quite prudent in opening new locations as in, you know, we've been looking at spots here for three, almost three years, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, then, and, um, finally found the right one. And so I think, uh, we are quite, although we're quite gung ho, we're also can be quite cautious. Um, we've definitely made mistakes into running into trying to do new things in the stores and getting equipment to do vacuum packing or, you know, making our own something and not thinking about the consequences of, you know, EHO and hygiene. And actually the reality is you can't do that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Um, so we are, we can, I think we have made mistakes being too gung-ho. Um, yeah. Well, as you said, you also need to try things yeah. out. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah, with yeah. that comes the consequences. And as long as you can learn fast, yeah, exactly. stop, figure yeah. out another plan, or, you know, it's the ability to deal with unpredictable things. Yeah. Because exactly. you don't always know how it's going to turn out. Yeah, yeah 100%. Mm. What did you learn about yourself during this time? Hmm. Um, oh, it's a tricky question. Um, <laughs> I've learned, well, I, I think I've learned, I love, you know, I love um, challenges and I, I really thrive off solving problems. Every single day we're having to solve, you know, quite big <laughs> problems uh, and we're doing it with a quite a small team. And, and I really enjoy that, you know, I think we build a very strong bond as a team. And, um, you know, uh, I've learned that it makes for really interesting conversations, you know, and, um, and I think one of the biggest things, and it sounds a bit cliche, but one of the biggest things I have, you know, didn't know before this is going back to lessons, but was, is learning to say no to opportunities. Cause I think now that we're becoming, uh, you know, a bit more successful we're getting tons of people contacting us to try new things or to get involved in new sites or locations but actually uh, there are distractions you know it's just focusing on what we need to do as a team or um and uh, it's it's a balance you know because you want to meet new people and you want to explore new opportunities but also you don't want to you know you want to look at opportunities that are going to benefit the business and not mm -hmm. somebody else which is, is challenging but i've learned that I love, um, yeah, I, I thrive off meeting new people, um, off, uh, you know, trying out new things. The, the business is a great platform for trying out new things every single day. And, and luckily my team are quite good at um, channeling, you know, my energy into a few things instead of trying to do mm. lots of things. Um, and then also, yeah, that I love dealing with different challenges and thinking around how to solve things because it, mm. it's fun. Whereas, you know, this morning, two people didn't show up and the team isn't we're meant to have four. So basically it's twice as much work and it's a lot more complexity. Uh, but, you know, it's fun. It's, a, if, as long, it's a, I, I do enjoy it. As long as you view it that way, I think that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. what makes the difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, like, uh, and I, I kind of enjoy having so many things, you know, like it's like mm -hmm. we, this morning we sent out vans across all the stores we sent out uh, online deliveries across uh, London and online deliveries across the UK. And we had 10 deliveries coming in at the same time, plus customers coming in and two people, you know, so, so it's kind of, it, I guess in scenarios like that, it's kind of, I kind of find it quite amusing because it is just a bit mad, like, but it's not, <laughs> it doesn't happen every day, but, you mm -hmm. know, having to troubleshoot and um, uh, I, I do enjoy that and thrive on, that so <laughs> yeah. you mentioned you know loving having the team yeah. how do you ensure that you surround yourself with the right people yeah i think i think we're quite lucky in that we've built a lot of the team through um friends and through connections um and also through the community like some a lot of the people we hire have been customers who are really interested in you know the efforts we make to source through regenerative or biodynamic farms. Um, 
I think are yeah it, it's people who are attracted to us often have a similar ethos and similar values um we've now started you know doing a proper interview process and onboarding process and things to try and you know excite people more um but we're also quite quick to you know if someone's not right then we don't so we always have a trial period you know where people do three or four shifts and if if it doesn't feel right then we'll say so so we're quite upfront um and we look you know it's a prerequisite to work with us is that you gotta love food you know as a start that's just as a basic <laughs> thing uh, you gotta be excited by food and then actually a lot of the people we've hired um have often worked in like supply chain security or seed uh, security or you know at soas or so so we've actually have tapped into a good network of people who are really passionate about the planet and similar areas that we're working in which is quite fortunate um it is challenging though because also the by the nature of like shop work people are quite transitory um so you know trying to capture people and excite them is definitely you know about the bigger picture mm -hmm. is definitely challenging and you know uh, uh, the core team have equity within the business um, and they are vested in it and they're excited by it and they can see a you know a vision for that mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so i think we we have been quite fortunate in our hiring and we're quite quick to decide you know it's a two-way thing if someone finds it too physical or um you know just doesn't like food then it's not quite the right place for them mm. so it's yeah. like high slow fire fast yeah <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, and that, that's what we're moving towards now. Like, we, you know, it might mean that we, the team, have to work harder for a little bit, but at the same time, it's about finding that right person who you know is mm. is lighthearted and fun and wants to get involved, and and also, it's interesting because going through different stages for the business um we are now looking for different people for different roles you know what i mean like initially it was pretty physical um like it, it was a lot of lifting and now we've we're actually looking for people you know who maybe are better at selling or you know what i mean it's it's interesting now the business has developed more because initially it was quite you know particularly there it's like you have to carry you know pallets up and down the stairs it's not what everyone would like to do you yeah. know so it's quite physical but now that we've got a team big enough, we actually, there's a more diversity reflected in the team. And, you know, it, mm -hmm. so it was just great for us. Mm. What makes you a good leader? Ooh, um, I think, I like to think what makes me a good leader is um, I'm prepared to do everything within the business and people can see that. So, you know, like I'll be sweeping the floor or I'll be lifting or, you know, any, any job I will do. Um, and I will, you know, not expect anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do. <laughs> um, I'm always listening to everyone. So, if, you know, particularly within such a fast paced uh, role, forward facing role, um, listening to people in terms of, you know, w how things are in their lives, what they want, what motivates them. Where do they want to be? You know, do they want to be more involved in marketing? Do they want to be more involved in logistics? Do they want to learn about e-commerce? Like, so is making sure that there's a learning path for people within the business is really important. Um, uh, and, and helping them to meet that trajectory. Um, uh, so I'd say and empathizing with people. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, sometimes I'll be the one who's telling people to take a step back, you know, which is... Uh, you wouldn't expect you know from someone who in what way like taking uh, a step back from like you know go and take a day off or you know like uh, mm. take some step away from the business because actually it's unhealthy to become too engrossed in the business because you it's important for you to go and I don't know go for some drinks or go and do some hobbies or you know what I mean like mm. because otherwise you can overly domineer and exp you know create a not a nice environment for people mm. so I think I'm pretty good at very good at listening to people um I, I will pull my weight a lot like oh and never expect other people to do things that mm. uh, i wouldn't do um and uh, yeah i think yeah how do you yourself not get too entrenched you're saying you're forcing mm. people to take time off yeah, yeah do you force yourself to take time off 
Yeah. Uh, I've started to recently. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting because I, uh, you know, I, 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 I get very excited by what we're doing. So I kind of, now I try and take two days off a week, but before I do six, six days a week, um, sometimes seven, but now I try and do like at least five, have two days roughly off. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always checking things, you know, sales and I, you know, I got to pay suppliers and so there'll always be things, but I don't really see it as like work as such. <laughs> um, mm. um, but definitely like now, at least one day a week, I'll be completely off and away mm -hmm. um, to make sure I, you know, go to the gym or go do some exercise, do swimming, cooking. I love cooking. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> uh, have, have you noticed that it has had an impact on your ability to run a business or like t taking that time off? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, it gives you perspective. So I just took a month off, which is the longest I've taken mm -hmm. off in a long time. And we, w one of the things we did was cycle around Albania um over like 11 days and that there uh i mean as an example like you would think that being an albania you'd be completely disconnected in, in the mountains but you know there's always stuff that does go wrong so when we're away you know the the shutter the shutter the electric started blowing in the store which for a, a retail store is a big deal because mm -hmm. all of your chilled and frozen products are screwed you know so then the electric started going and then the, you, I ha, you have to get them fixed. And then basically a bit of a boring story, but the shutter then was shuttered, was, uh, wouldn't raise. So then they couldn't open the store. So there are certain things that sometimes I have to be called to, <laughs> to deal with, even if I'm, uh, you know, far away. But I think, um, when you're you know, cycling and on holiday, I think it gives you much more perspective. You know, mm -hmm. it's very easy to feel, oh my God, like, you know, are we going to succeed? Or, you know, will this work? Um, this is the most important thing. But actually, you know, going away and just hanging out and spending time with your friends and your girlfriend or boyfriend, you know, is it's so important and it's nice. Um, and you also meet new people. You gain different perspectives. You know, we, we I spent a bit of time in America and even there, you know, I went around to so many, you know, yeah. I was like, I went down to so many different like stores and stuff. And for me, it's quite exciting to see what's going on, people doing similar things, but, at, you know, different scales and smaller sizes, bigger sizes. So um, I think it's quite inspiring. And I think you get inspiration as well, just from, from not thinking about mm -hmm. it, you know, it's like if you focus on this one spot then you can't think of anything especially for creative ideas you can't just sit there and say be creative yeah come yeah, up yeah. with a solution mm. right now you can be in that space when you need to do something very very particular which yeah. does not require any kind of creative Definitely. thinking or yeah. creative problem solving 100%. but taking it you know your brain is still working in the background yeah. when you're somewhere else it's just you're feeding mm. more interest more mm. inspiration more lightness as yeah. opposed to just trying to solve it in exactly the same way that you have been exactly. trying to solve it before yeah um i just find it fascinating how that works that being yeah. able to just look in a different direction yeah. and then it still brings you back in a completely different way yeah, and definitely. brings you more definitely so, yeah. and and for me the, the 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 things that do that for me are the sauna <laughs> so i okay. go to the sauna probably three times a week or come October, we start our cold water swimming club. And, you know, those are things that are like, you know, you, you finish and you, you feel like, hi, you feel amazing. And uh, they're really good at giving you perspective on things rather than mm. sort of becoming like focused in. <laughs> well, you're being so in the present moment. Like yeah, you cannot yeah, yeah. be anywhere <laughs> so cold. else. You're just, you're just trying to survive that. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's something about physical stress on the body yeah. that makes you feel more alive. Yeah. As opposed to like the chronic stress of, oh, yeah. that person said this to me. What does that mean? Yeah, or exactly. an, um, an email that you interpret as if it's, you know, somehow, you know, terrible and damaging. Yeah. But, you know, real kind of physical stresses take yeah. you out of that chronic stress in a weird way yeah winter. well it trivializes those things doesn't it and uh, especially when it's like two degrees in the water you can't think of anything else. <laughs> so no cool. i think it's literally that where you're uh, you're, you're uh, so hyper focused yeah. on the present moment that <laughs> is very healthy for you yeah so, yeah. yeah so what is next for you what's next for nourish communities mm. 
Um, good question. I think our core focus has been this, this September is our first month being profitable. So I think our next kind of the next, well, Christmas is next. So it's just a mm. big period for retail. Um, we do lots of gifting. Uh, we, we've launched, you know, corporate B2B hampers. Um, and uh, so that's kind of our next three month goal is to make the most of Christmas and uh, get our hampers out there. Um, What's in your hampers? Uh, we have a big mixture. We do like British charcuterie hamper, British cheese hampers, um, uh, cider, there are lots of British ciders. So it, it really depends. So typically a lot of our hampers are sort of curated to specific clients' needs um, or themes, you know, or we engage with different artists to local artists to create uh, messages and things. So um, everything really, uh, you know, from meat, cheese, um, to uh, alcohol, to chocolates, to a, a real combo of things. So, but you try to keep it local. So say you have a client yeah. in like Manchester or mm. wherever, you, you're sourcing yeah. local, local farms produce. and products. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So we try and will be given a brief almost it might it can be as specific as a location or it might be we've got people who are gluten-free or vegan or so we do like a, a hamper curated around local london products which is very popular and uh, then we can dispatch those all around the uk so um so last year we did lots of hampers and this year we've kind of i, I like i said before we were being compared to Fortnum Masons and Selfridges when we actually just had one store and now we're much bigger. Um, we've put a lot more effort into the design and the baskets and the hampers, so uh, which is exciting. And I, I think in terms of longer term, our strategy is sort of focus on the three stores and get them like very get them profitable and get them to a point where I think then we we need to decide as a team. But it's sort of then I think do we look at you know acquiring other stores and improving them do we look at starting a bakery uh, is something we're exploring that we've been looking at today um do we look at you know franchising um almost creating cooperatives around the uk um so there are lots of yeah things we're exploring um the the next sort of focus in come january is going to be my background is in kind of e-commerce and online the logistics and to be honest so far you know most of our revenue it, it initially was online and then obviously it went down and down and now the majority of our revenue is in store because we do you know physical tastings we do lots of really interesting interactive experiences in store the next process for us is very much sort of how do we grow online um and how do we you know we've got five thousand customers online how do we nurture those customers and engage with them more because to be honest so far we've neglected them a bit you know mm. um so i think there's a massive opportunity there where shops can only get to a certain size so it's how do we then either open more stores or how do we start to utilize the pre-existing you know assets and infrastructure we have to um uh, you know uh, fulfill orders and almost so um i think we've got a lot of exciting you know times ahead of us um i think the you know, that's sort of we'll be deciding over the next three and four months really so yeah we'll i will be able to update you soon yeah, it's very <laughs> yeah. exciting and um you know your hampers sound amazing mm -hmm. and you know what you're doing within the store and bringing people together i mean you're just full of ideas like yeah. I, I mean i wonder what it's like to be in your head like with all of this talking to people being inspired being really passionate about food and bringing people together and yeah, I'm just really excited for other things that you will come up with because like yeah. you're so full of energy, <laughs> like it's infectious. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what you've what you've Thank you. you know put together. So yeah, I'm very excited Thank for your you. future. Yeah, <laughs> well, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, where where's the best place for people to find you or to reach out to you? Um, if anyone wants to contact me, feel free to email on it's rollo r o l l o at nourishcommunities.com. Um, so feel free to email on there or on Instagram it's predominantly me managing there so you can message on there or equally you know go to our website and there's contact information there too so yeah if anyone listening you know wants any advice or wants to get in contact to you know 
swap ideas or exchange uh, stories, feel free to get in touch. We're always happy to meet for coffee or a beer. And uh, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so yeah, much, Rollo. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Well, thank you really for having me. That. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.